Genesis chapter number 2. We're going to talk about Eden, Eden for a few minutes this morning. <clears throat> let's, uh, let's just read, there's not a lot of verses in that chapter, let's just read that, so follow along with me, Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished, and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which he had created and made. This is the history or the genealogy of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the heaven or the earth and the heavens, before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth. There was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put a man, or the man, whom he had formed. And out of the ground of the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon, it is the one which skirts uh, the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the other, the gold of that land is good, Bedelium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon, it is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hittikel, and it is the one which goes Toward the east of Assyria, the fourth river is Euphrates. Then God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat eat of it you shall surely die. The Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone, and I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of, the, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every and bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. The Lord God called, caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept and he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for the reading of your word. As we study today, Together, I pray that your spirit would guide us, uh, your word would just continue to, to be settled into our mind, into our heart, that it might continue to form uh, not only our view, uh, our worldview from a biblical standpoint, God, but, but to help us understand more about who you are, about your love and provision for us, about the fact that you not only created, uh, but you provided, you sustain, and um, God, it's just all because of you that we are here today and have what we have, do what we do. May it all be for your glory, for your honor and your praise. So thankful again for Jesus. We ask it in his name. All God's people said, amen. I was thinking last week, you know, we talked um, a little bit about being made in his image. And, and I wanted to get something out of the way because I was reprimanded when I got home. Um, Jaden reprimanded me. He said, Daddy, he said, why didn't you pull out the old preacher joke? What are you talking about? Well, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And so um, I thought I'd just start out with that. Good for you, Jaden. Man and woman, man and woman. We established that last week, but I want to emphasize that when he said, I made man out of the dirt of the ground, then he caused a deep sleep and put 
um, brought, brought out of the side. You know, the translation said rib. It, it means side, but, you know, uh, we always think about the rib because that comes out of the side. Take that rib out, made woman, right? Brings woman to man, and where does he place them? Right there in Eden, right there in a garden, right? I want you to see the design of man, right? I want you to see the, 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 the intricacy of, of man. I want you to see the creation of man. I want you to understand that God did everything that he did for a purpose. He made everything that he made for a purpose. He, he made man for a purpose. And as he made him, I was thinking the other day about, about what he did for us. Because not only did he, he make us in his image, not only did he make us us for his purposes and his glory, but he made us in such a way that we have designed within us some guidelines, if you will, some guardrails, some, some, some uh, boundaries in our, in our makeup, if you will. And, and I was thinking about the five senses, right? So God designed us, God created us with five senses, touch, sight, hearing, taste, and smell. And if you think about just the basic five senses that God created with us, each of those senses um, they, they, they're, they're created to give us um, a boundary, if you will, to protect us from harm. Because most of the time, let's be honest, most of the time, when, when we touch something that's hot, we have a tendency to pull back, right? It, it, we, we have that natural reaction instilled by God. When we see something and we identify that as dangerous, we, we back up or we avoid that, right? When we hear something that, that, that is threatening to us, it causes our, our body to react differently. Or we taste something that, that doesn't taste right. Our body is designed to reject that taste. When we, it's kind of like salad. Um, when, we, when we smell something, um, I know some of y'all like salad. That's okay. Um, because we're going to see in just a moment that's kind of the way we were designed <laughs> to be vegetarians. And thank God that he took that, that away after the, after the ark. We'll get to there eventually. We smell something. It doesn't smell just right, and, and you kind of avoid that. So God built within us, right, these, these basic senses to alert us to potential harm, built in safeguards, if you will, to protect us. And each of those senses are important in how we learn, how we interact, how we react, how we, how we, um, how we kind of avoid things and, and protect us from harm, embrace things that might bring us benefit and enjoy things that are meant for our pleasure. I think about before, uh, you know, when God created Adam, he put him in the garden. Uh, he didn't, he, he, Eve wasn't initially in there with him. And, and the text that we just read, and we just talked about this last week, I think, but uh, when Adam was in that garden, God brought all of the animals, all of the kinds, right, to him for him to name them. And he identified all of them and how they could be useful uh, for different things. But he didn't find a, a helper, a compatible partner for him within all the created beings. And that's when God did what he did with creating Eve. All of these things he saw, man, I love the way that looks. I love, man, the beauty of that animal, the, 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 all of these things. God, Adam says, man, this is really cool, but God, I'm missing something. I'm missing something. And that's when he created Eve. And that's why he said, Adam said, this is bone of my bones. This is flesh of my flesh. This is part of me, part of me. And we talked about all of that. And when we think about Eden, the land of Eden, the region of Eden, the, the garden in Eden, all through the Bible, I want us to, to think about the fact that God put people in certain places for, for, for certain reasons. He got, he, God made places just for man. And, and when he made places for man, he also gave man some boundaries. He gave man some laws. He gave man some commands, some warnings. Like, hey, this is, this is don't do this. Because there's, there's consequences for that, but you can do this, and there's blessings for that. We see that all throughout the scriptural. So even though he created us to use our basic senses for protective, protective measures, if you will, notice also that the way God designed us, the way God created us, was with the freedom of choice. He gave us choice. He doesn't leave us with just one option. But he sets before us right ways that glorify him, wrong ways that, that, that don't glorify him, right ways that, that honor him, wrong ways that, that, I mean, just are feeding their flesh, right? So God is clear in his communication of blessings that are connected with obedience and, and cursings and consequences that are, that are made with disobedience. That's why when he made the garden, he said, Adam, you can eat everything, right, except from this one particular tree. So when God created man, he, pre he prepared a perfect home for him prepared everything that he needed to sustain life, and there was freedom to choose within that garden. Outside of that garden, if he would say, okay, God, I take you at your word, or 
He said, well, God, I'm just not sure about that. He gave him choice. Not only did God give Adam and Eve choices, he, gave, he gives us choice, right? And that's what we're going to talk about today a little bit. We're going to talk about the fact that, that God gave us a choice. God puts us in these scenarios. God puts us in these places in our life and gives us a choice. We can either choose to trust him or we can trust ourselves, right? We can either choose to obey God or we can disobey and trust ourselves. We, we all, we've always had this choice, but before we get that, to that, let's think about the region of Eden because the Bible tells us right here in our text that he, uh, there, was a, there was ground. Out of the, he, he made the ground. And by the way, let me, let, me, let me say this. I don't know if I said it last week. When God said, when God calls the land to come up out of the sea, most of your, of your Bible scholars agree that the fact when that land came up, it was one solid landmass. It was not yet divided into, you know, when you look at a world map today, you see all these continents. When it was originally created, there was one landmass. And so when we think about Eden we're, and the region of Eden, we're thinking about a particular part of that one landmass. So let's think about the geographical location of Eden, and, and there's not much to, to really talk about here, but I wanted you to understand that when, when we read the Bible, right, we think about the Scripture, and it says that the Lord God, verse 8, planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put man whom he had formed. So all that the Bible tells us about this place, about this region, about, about Eden, about the garden that is in Eden, about the geographical location of that is the fact that it was in the east. That's it. East of what? Well, any time or most of the time when you read the, the scriptures and it's giving you directions, most of the time you're, you need to think about the direction northeast, southwest from Israel. So if you think about who wrote this, Moses being the author, and you think about when he wrote this, after the Exodus, before the entering into the Promised Land, he was thinking about the, the land that they were about to inherit. So he says east of that. Well, there's a lot of ground east of that, but we don't get much instruction outside of that other than it was east throughout. So a lot of your scholars will say, well, it was somewhere in the Mesopotamian region, and that, that is most likely the case. But when you think about these rivers, because uh, I know when I, was, uh, when I was a young man, I heard uh, a man I loved dearly talk about these rivers and say, well, this is exactly where the Garden of Eden was because we have these rivers. And, and understand something that, that while we can say it was probably in that region, we, we can't say dogmatically this is where it was. Right? Even though when we read down through those verses, we recognize the, the Euphrates River. We recognize the Tigris River. We recognize those. Well, um, if I were to say I'm going to Bethlehem, where am I going? Huh? Where? Bethlehem. Yeah, where am I going? Am I going to the Middle East? Am I going to Arkansas? Am I going to New Hampshire? Am I going to Pennsylvania? Am I going to Connecticut? Because there's a lot of Bethlehems, <laughs> all right? So, so I, want, I wanted to illustrate that because when, when, um, when these rivers were named, right, they were named after rivers that they once were familiar with. Right when when Noah uh, come off the ark and, and started to repopulate the world and began to name different places. He would name them out of things that were familiar to him. Now, think about, uh, we hadn't got there yet, but think about the global flood, right? So, so we think about where the, the region of Eden is and the geographical location of that, and, and we've got to understand that it was just one area in the landmass, but consider the global flood for a moment because the global flood would have destroyed Eden altogether. It would have destroyed the garden altogether, right? That's the reason we can't be dogmatic about specific location of Eden, the specific location of the garden, because God, number one, because God didn't give us that location, but number two, because after the global flood, everything changed. Like globally, everything changed. The Bible tells us that waters are coming up out of the ground. It's splitting the ground, right? You're, the the land, mass is, the land mass is splitting into different ways. There's water coming down, water coming up. You know, you have the flood. Then, then after the flood, all the runoff, it's, it's making uh, all kinds of, of new pathways for rivers and streams. And, I mean, there's so much that, that we have to think about and, and understand that when we, we say Eden and the Garden of Eden, we can't be dogmatic about the exact location of that. However, one thing that... I would think that we all would agree on is this. We don't need to know where it was in order to know that it was, right? The Bible says that there was a land of Eden. 
So, so there was. The Bible says there was a garden within Eden. So there was, right? So, so we know that God said because it is, it existed. And, and, and there's, there's more importance in, in my mind of what happened in the garden than what was around it or, or where it was at and things of that nature. So let's spend a few moments, a few moments, talking about the Garden of Eden because it's here that we're going to talk about some things that happened yeah, and then next week in Genesis chapter 3, we've got to remember it all happened there too. Next, next week is going to be like the, whew, man, it's going, to, it's going to hurt right here because we know what's coming, right? So God had a plan in, in his creation. He had a garden with this abundance of fruit, abundance of grains, abundance of vegetables, and all that was made to sustain Adam, to sustain his wife, to sustain his kids and, and the family that, that, they would, that they were potentially going to raise there. We, of course, we know what happens, but while there were plenty of, of uh, things in the, in the garden, we've got to think about what's outside of the garden because we don't know how many species of trees and plants and, and all of that was was inside the garden but think about it what God had created on on all the land mass all of that was productive all of that was useful all of that was beneficial the Bible says it was either beneficial for food or it was beneficial to look at either either pleasing for the body or pleasing for the eye it was pretty right some of y'all some of y'all know that there's trees and bushes and plants and flowers out there that's really pretty to look at but you don't want to eat them Right? I don't go through the woods thinking, man, that's pretty, and try, you don't do that, right? The, so God said it's either good for food or it's good for the eye. It's pleasing for the sight. So within this garden and even around Eden, there, there would have been other resources, not only for, for basic needs, but when you think about the, uh, the, the regions that you, see, you have this river that's coming out of Eden, right? It breaks off into four, uh, into four tributaries, and it talks about gold, and it talks about uh, stones, and it talks about all these useful things that are, that, are, uh, that are productive in those regions. It makes me think about, in my mind's eye, and, and you know, it's, it's creative sometimes, Man, Adam's walking through the garden, or Eve's walking through the garden one day, and, and they see something sparkly on the ground. She bends down and picks it up, and what we, was, what we would call a diamond, she's looking at it, right? Or a ruby or, or something like that. She's looking at it. Man, that sure is, that sure is pretty. You see, everything that, that man needed for, for food, everything that man needed for sustenance, everything that man needed for functionality was right there around him in the garden, how do we eat? Most of us have a fork or a spoon or a bowl or a plate. None of that was done yet, right? So as they're eating off of trees and eating off of plants and eating the grain and different things, over time they would begin to understand, okay, I need what we would call a bowl. So they would design that. You know, everything that we have from a day-to-day basis was designed somewhere by someone. All of that wasn't thought of, but God made everything that man needed for everything that we have even today. That, that man's designed things from. Think about the beautiful flowers. Think about the aromatic shrubs. Think about the, the colorful blooms on the, on the different plants and the trees. Think about the, the crystal clear waters. Think about those trophy class whitetail that was walking through the garden. Think, I mean, you know, the big bass that was in the lake. I, you know, just go wild, right? All of that reminds us of our benevolent creator. All of that reminds us of God's love for us. Like I love... Well, let me let me crawfish on that. In a normal year, when it's not a dry and dusty and and horribly uh, bad for allergies in the woods, I love being in the woods. I love it, seeing the wildlife, seeing seeing the things that God has made, right? Because it reminds me of who He is. It reminds me of His provision. It reminds me of His love. It reminds me of His grace. It reminds me of all of that. And, and we're years and years and years past the original creation, right? We're, we're, we're seeing the, we see the effects of the curse on everything, and yet it's so, much of it's so beautiful. And just think about when Adam and Eve, given that home, that environment to live in, and, and saying, man, God did this for us. God did this for us. It was a place of provision for man. It was a place of purpose, a place of purpose for man. Look at what it says Verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to, of Eden to tend it and to keep it. In other words, to, to watch over it. In other words, to use it, to, to work and watch. So Adam was to, to work in the garden. Adam was to watch over the garden. Adam was, was given that particular place as a home to live in. 
And, and what's beautiful about this is that, that work as we see it wasn't originally uh, part of the curse. I mean, we, we think about work being, oh, man, it's so hard, and, and, and I hate to go to work, I hate to do this, I hate to do this, but, but all of that is a result of the curse. Originally, work was glorifying to God. Work was something that, that gave us purpose. Work was something that gave us pleasure. Work was something that provided for the daily deeds. God made man to work. God made man to labor, right? God made man to be productive. <laughs> and he put him into a place where, where it wasn't work. Uh, years ago, a guy told me, he said, if, if, you, can, if you can, quote, unquote, go to work and, and, and enjoy it, man, if you enjoy what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And many of us are, are like that, and some of us just hate to go to work because we don't like really maybe some of the people we work with or maybe what we do. But it wasn't designed to be like that. It was designed for man to get up, to be productive, to do something for the glory and the honor of God. Whatever you have, like as you've earned from a living, whatever you have at your house or maybe your, your possession, whatever you possess, let me, let me tell you, God allows you to possess that. That's part of his grace towards you. That's part of his gift towards you. Your, your, your family is a gift, right? Your, your food, that's a gift. That's a grace of God. But guess what? Sometimes, sometimes that does come with work. But man, how often do you thank God that you have the ability to work? How often do you thank God that you have the strength and energy to go? How often do you thank God that you have the job to go to, right? We need to think about the benevolent creator that we have in Almighty God and the fact that he has given us purpose. Even after the curse that we'll talk about next week, even, even after everything that's bad that's happened in the, in the, in the history of, of humanity according to sin, even all of that, God still blesses us. God still provides for us. God still gives us his graces, he gives us everything that we need. You know, one thing that I was thinking about, let's go back to that verse again. God put them in the garden and said, took, or took man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it, to watch over it, to observe the ways that he could be the best caretaker possible to that gift. Allow me to, allow me to, to throw something at you. Wherever, wherever God's got you at, whatever job, you're doing, maybe you're a, a stay-at-home mom, or maybe, maybe you work in school, or maybe you work in medical field, maybe you work wherever you work, God has you there to be the best caretaker that you can be. He wants you to be the best steward of that job, of that gift, of that occupation, of that career that you can be, because you're there for a reason. You're there for a purpose. You're there for the benefit of the kingdom. So, so remember that. God, God's given you that as a gift. God's allowed you to be there, to, to, uh, to, to borrow from the Bible, to subdue that area for the kingdom, to work in that area for the glory of God. He wants you to watch over it. He wants you to work it. He wants you to, to observe the ways that you can be a, a good caretaker of that, a good steward of that, a good beneficiary of that. Anything that God gives you is for his glory and for your good. But one thing that I want you to understand, look what it says again in that verse. God, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden. So God put him there to tend it and to keep it. Because here's what I know. With supply and with purpose come responsibility. I'm pretty sure that, that whoever your supervisor is, or maybe you are a supervisor, whichever way that goes, you expect certain things of your employees. Or if you are an employee, you're, you are expected by them to do certain things, to act certain ways, to, to, to make certain productivity in, in your particular job. God didn't say, hey, Adam, go out there in the garden, uh, hang a hammock, and just chill, man. Just, you're good. Now, that would have been pretty neat, right? But he didn't. He said, Adam, I'm going to put you, this is your home, to work, to watch over it. You've got a responsibility here in your environment, in your home. And, man, that's challenging to me. I hope it's challenging to you because the, the, the fact remains that we still have responsibility where we're at for the glory of God. We have a purpose. It was a place of purpose for man. It was a place of communion for man. I love the fact that the Lord himself, when he made Adam, he said, Adam, come here. <laughs> Let me show you a place I made for you. 
The Bible tells us, and we'll see it next week, there's, a, there's an allusion to uh, God coming and walking in the garden with Adam, communing with God in the garden with Adam, talking to him. I believe, per, purpose, personally, I believe that God met with Adam in the garden on more than one occasion. I believe that it was in that garden that not only did God initiate communion through relationship but, and gave, gave Adam some instruction and, and brought Adam his wife, right? It was in the garden that he brought his wife to Adam. It was there that, that he, would, he would have communion with God. It was there that he would have relationship with his wife. It was there that there was fellowship all in that place that God created for them. The garden was designed for that. The garden was intended to be a place where God would continually have open communion with man. He would continually be un- uninterrupted by sin. He would continually be, be uh, in the presence of insurmountable joy. That was God's intention for the garden. Say, Adam, this is your home. Eve, this is your home. Y'all raise a family. Like, like, like y'all populate the earth and start right here. This is how I designed you. This is how I made you. And then I'm going to come hang out with you every once in a while. Man, that, wouldn't, that, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know about you. I was sitting, I was sitting in the woods yesterday. Jaden was in his, his blind bow hunting, and I was riding around, walking around, doing some scouting. And, and um, I got to the point where I thought, you know what, I'm just going to stop. I'm going to be still because I don't do that enough, and y'all probably don't do that enough either. Just go somewhere uninterrupted and be still. Just get with God. And I was thinking about the garden in that moment. I was thinking about how he was probably listening to birds sing and, and who knows what all other animals were, were making sounds. In my mind, you know, I think about all kinds of things that's right here around us. But, man, you think about the water trickling and the birds singing, maybe the frogs singing, all these things, and he's just there in, in the middle of paradise. And then maybe, just maybe, God shows up. And says, hey, Adam, man, you love this, don't you? Yes, I do. Come here, Eve. (laughs) Now how do you like it? (laughs) Right? This is for you. And Adam's like, this is for me, right? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Living in the place of paradise. Living in the place of the presence of God. Living in the place of of communion with God. I, I I want you to kind of picture that in your mind's eye because even though we don't have that place now, I really believe that's how the home and the church is supposed to be. I believe your home is to be a place where where you commune with God. I believe that the church right here is a place that we commune with God. I believe it's a place where God says, hey, I want to meet with you, a place where God says, I want to remind you of who you are, a place where God says, hey, I want to remind you of what you're to do, a place that God says, hey, you're not alone. (laughs) Because sometimes we feel so alone. Sometimes we feel like we have no purpose, no calling, no, no reason to be here. But God says, no, I'm with you. I'm beside you. I've given you what you have. I've set you on a mission for me. And I think about the place of communion, the Garden of Eden. Even though we don't have it, there, we're not going to find it. It's not to be found and, and re-experienced. I want you to know that even after the curse, God still says, I want to come to you. I want to come to you. I want to commune with you. I want to be with you. With that comes a choice. A choice. The garden was a place for provision. A garden was a place of purpose. A garden was a place of communion. The garden was a place of choice. Remember what it says there in verse number 16? The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Like Adam, look around. Man, you can eat all of this. All of that. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Now what other tree was in the middle of the garden? The tree of life. So God says you can eat all these trees. And somewhere in the middle of the garden was the tree of life and the tree of of knowledge of good and evil. God says you can eat of all the trees. The tree of life was one of those trees. He could eat of that tree. But don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We'll, we'll address that more next, next week. But I want you to understand that, that Adam was given freedom, total reign, total freedom to eat of anything. And God says, just don't eat of that one. Don't eat of that one because you're going to die. It will bring death. The tree was not a problem. 
There was nothing evil about the tree. There was nothing evil about the fruit on the tree. There was this decision for Adam to make. God says, don't do it. Adam, God, Adam, you're free. You can do whatever you want to, but don't eat that. Make the choice not to eat that. I was thinking about verse 9 where it says that, that all, everything in the garden was pleasant to the sight. It's either, it's either pleasant to the sight or it's good for food. You know, we always think about those trees being fruit trees. Most of y'all probably got an apple in your mind when you think about the tree of life because that's the depiction that we've always seen. The Bible doesn't say it was an apple tree. The Bible doesn't say it was a fruit tree, you know. So, so we don't know what tree it was. But God says, hey, you can eat off of this one, but don't eat off of that one. Well, if you're a little bit human like me, I'm thinking, God, why did you even make it? Did y'all ever thought, think of that? God, why did you even make the tree of knowledge of good and evil and then say don't, make, don't eat that because then you'll die? Why did you even do that? Because, because now Adam's tempted. Well, we know that God is not the author of evil, right? God, is, God doesn't tempt people to do evil. God made Adam and Eve. God made all of this. God designed all of this. God placed all of this. God caused all of this to grow for the benefit and, and, the, and, the, and the will of, or the purpose of, of Adam and, and humanity. So, so he says you have freedom, freedom. Now, if he wouldn't have put that there, there would have been no choice to make. There wouldn't have been a choice between God's um, word, trusting God's word, or not trusting God. There would have been no choice to make, so there would have been no freedom. God created us in his image, and part of that creation is giving us the freedom to choose. Part of that image is giving us the opportunity to, to make that choice, to, to do the right thing, to, to do the things that glorify God. To, to, because here, here's what I know. Freedom comes with choice. Choice comes with, with responsibility every time. We're free to choose, but that choice comes with responsibility. Right? We're responsible for our actions. And God said, God said, the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die he didn't know what that meant but he had one of two choices trust God or don't trust God or trust yourself I mean there was an abundance of food sources around him right trees that that, that did everything that he needed bushes that had everything that he needed you know all kinds of stuff he had everything that he needed and, and God says look Will you trust me? Will you trust me? Will you choose life or will you choose death? I was thinking um, this morning about all throughout Scripture when, when, God, when God put things before his people, he says, hey, you can choose life or you can choose death. You can choose blessing or you can choose cursing. Which one are you going to choose? Why did he do that over and over and over and over again? Because we're made in his image. We're made with a choice. We're given the opportunity to choose God. We're given the opportunity to choose life. We're given the opportunity to choose righteousness. We're given the opportunity to choose the things that are good for us. Because here's what I know. Every time that I've chosen not to do what God clearly said do, it wasn't a good, it wasn't a good idea. It was a bad choice. I, I hurt because of it. Right? Anytime you choose something that feeds your flesh, it's going to hurt. Anytime you choose something that, that disobeys the Word of God, it's going to hurt. Anytime you choose, uh, hey, I'm telling you, every time that you, that you rebel against the clear teachings of the Word of God, the clear commands of the Word of God, the consequences are not going to be fine. But you had a choice. You had a choice. And, and allow me to go ahead and throw up the takeaway, Jim. Allow me to, to just land on that because that's where we're going to start next week. You have a choice. You have a choice. You have a choice today. You'll have a choice throughout the day. You'll have a choice every day that the Lord doesn't tarry is coming or you aren't taken home. You have a choice. You can either trust God or you can reject Him. You can either say, yes, God, I want to follow you, or you can reject Him. You can say, yes, God, I want to, I want to serve you, or you can reject Him. You can say, yes, God, I believe you, or you can reject Him. You can say, yes, God, I, I, I know that your way is best, or you, can, you have a choice. You have a choice. 
So I want to ask you to close your copy of God's Word. Turn off whatever. Bow your head for just a moment. Because I want to, once again today, give you a choice. Choice. As you're bowing there and you're thinking about where you're at in your life, where you're at in your relationship to God, I want you to consider the choices that's before you because we all have them to make. Maybe as you're bowed there today, the choice that you need to make is to trust Jesus and, and ask him to forgive you of your sins and to be your Savior. Maybe, maybe the choice is about salvation. Maybe the Lord's been dealing with you and, and, and right now he, he's essentially asking you through the conviction of the Spirit, will you trust me? Maybe that's the choice that you have to make. Maybe the choice is, okay, man, you've made the decision to trust Jesus and, and, and now the choice is, okay, am I, am I going to follow that through baptism? Am I going to trust God and, and put aside any other feelings I may have and just, just man, just submit to baptism? I'm going to trust Him and, and put that on display. Maybe that choice is to be a part of his church here at Caney. Maybe that choice is to follow him today in a way that you've not followed him in days past. What's, what's the choice before you today? Will you choose to follow Jesus? Will you choose to trust the Lord? Will you choose to say yes? to your creator, to your designer, to the one who loves you so deeply that he has nothing but good in store for you. Will you choose Jesus? Father in heaven, I pray this morning that you would just be glorified today as we are bowed, the Spirit is moving among us and drawing us to the, to your purposes Got to know that, that it can be scary sometimes to follow Jesus. Got to know that it can be intimidating by the world around us to follow Jesus. Got to know that it can be hard. It can complicate things. But I also know, God, that it's the best decision that we can make. So, Father, help us to let go of whatever we've been holding on to so tightly and say, yes, God, I'm going to follow you. I choose you. Father, I pray that your spirit would continue to move and enable us to make that decision for your glory today. We're going to give you the praise. We're going to give you the honor. We're going to give you the glory in all that we do. And we're going to do it in Jesus' name.